Uh, thank you for having me here today. Uh, I'm going. I'm one of the um, creators of the um, open source project um, that we do at Hasura, and uh, um, um, uh, and now one of the founders of the company behind it as well. Uh, this is an open source project which gives you, uh, which generates a real time GraphQL backend for you on top of uh, database and uh, Postgres today, and uh, kind of gives you good fine grained kind of access control and authorization that integrates with your own authentication system. Um, and some eventing for you to be able to trigger um, serverless functions and stuff like that. And I'll, I'll uh, uh, hopefully do a demo at the end if you have a little bit of time. Um, in this talk, I'm going to um, introduce you to um, GraphQL and um, take you over my... So, so I was a GraphQL skeptic till about a year ago. Um, and <laughs> and because, because of the way that when I read about GraphQL and I uh, and I read what GraphQL was. It did not click for me in like five ten minutes, and um, and that made me defer trying to understand it for a while. Uh, but then once we once once I did understand it, I realized that um, there were these three or four things that made it really click for me and understand why it's amazing. It's very simple technology, but it's absolutely amazing uh, for the things that it does. And hopefully, I'll be able to show, share those uh, aha moments with you. Right. So I call it peeling back the layers of the GraphQL onion. Uh, and um, and I think the best way to start off is to, to talk about an API call. So so let's say we have an API call for a user profile page. So on a mobile or web app, we're building a user profile page. And what we are doing is we need to capture, um, you know, we need to make an API call to say get um, slash user ID equal to one. And then we get a JSON from the server that says ID is one and name is Elmo, right? And we get that JSON and then we render that into the UI and that's our API call done. So, so this works fine. Now imagine that we have to modify the UI and we have to update, uh, you know, we have to kind of update the mobile or web app or whatever we have. And we want to make uh, another API call to, uh, we need to make another API call to add address information. Because on the profile page, we want to show not just your uh, name, but also the address uh, your most recent address, say, right? So then we make another API call to say slash API slash address, you know, user ID equals one, and then we get that JSON. So then this resolves, and then we kind of get this JSON, we render this on the on the front end, right? Uh, this is this is yuck because because we have to make two API calls now instead of making one API call, right? And imagine that we have, um, and this was a very simple example, right? But imagine a more complicated scenario. Uh, the more number of API calls we have, the worse it gets. Uh, and and I don't know if the gray boxes show up, but it's like you'll see that different parts of the UI load at different times, right? Because you're making multiple API calls, so each of those API calls are getting resolved uh, independently. And as they get resolved independently, the UI shows up, right? This is this is this is a bad developer experience. It's not fun to write code like this, and it's also a bad user experience. I don't know if you've had the experience of going to a website where it loads very quickly. And then after it loads very fast, you're just about to click on a button, but then something else loads and the button shifts, and you click on something else by mistake, right? Uh, whenever that happens, I find it I find it so irritating. Um, but that's essentially one of the problems with like you know you have API calls that resolve at different uh, at different times and resolve independently. So so because this is a problem, um, what what people frequently do is that uh, you know the front end team talks to the back end team and says. Uh, you know, you talk to the API developer and say, hey, you know, can you help us out? Um, we want one API call instead of making two or ten API calls, right? Uh, so instead of making one call for fetching the profile info and one call for fetching the address info, can we just make one API call and get all of the information in one shot? And then the backend developer, the API developer says, what, why, I don't want to do this. This is not useful work. I've already done the work for two API calls. You just want me to merge it into one. This just seems like extra unnecessary work. And then the front end team has to convince the back end team that you know it's not unnecessary work, it's it's huge, it's important for us because we need one API call, otherwise the experience is terrible. Um, and then the API developer goes and leaves, you know, takes a break or whatever, you know, stuff happens. But effectively, maybe a few weeks later, you get an API endpoint that has all of the data unified into one point, right? So you get API slash user info, you make a get call to that with ID one, and now you get all of that information in one JSON, right? Which is cool. And, and now finally, you know, we have one API call that fetches um, and that shows us all our data. And this is great. And this works great till you realize that, um, you know, you want to 
you are building a web experience and a mobile experience. And on the web, you want to show more info. You want to show the username, the address. You want to show the last orders. If this was like a e-commerce kind of site, right? You want to show the last few orders. Um, you want to show. Uh, you want to show the. Um, you want to show the. And and on mobile, I'm sorry. Excuse me. You on on mobile. What you need to do is you you want to show lesser information, right? You don't want to show all of that information. You want to show. You just want to show username and maybe the city of the address. You don't want to show anything else. But now the problem is that you're making one API call, and this API call is returning like 200 KB of data. And so you're getting all that data in this huge JSON. But out of that huge JSON, you only use a tiny portion of it to show your data on on the mobile. Um, and maybe you use all of it to show data on the web, right? Uh, on on a desktop. Uh, and and this is um, and this is also painful, right? Because now you're just fetching a lot of extra information. Um, extra data, or uh, when you don't need to fetch that extra data, so that's higher latency, uh, and that's a slower experience for your users again, right? So what you then do is go back to your API developer and you say, hey, can you modify the API endpoint that you gave me, and can you um, can you add an additional parameter to it? And this parameter would be something like a fields parameter, right? Um, and what we do here is I'll specify what fields. Of the JSON, I actually want. So instead of just saying I want slash user info, I'll say I want slash user info, and the fields of the user info that I want are ID, name, and address dot city, right? So I don't want address dot street, I don't want the last ten orders, I don't want all of that. I just want these three fields, right? And then the server parses this. Uh, just a second, right? And then the server parses this like comma separated list. Uh, realize that you want ID name and address and address dot city. It parses the string uh, and then make sure that the response that you get only contains this data, right? So that way you can kind of now be in control of what information you want to fetch, right? But this is a problem. Not only have we iterated with our API developers back and forth multiple times, but we have also, um, you know, we've also created our own syntax and language here that. Is not standard, right? It's something that is just an agreement between between the front end team and the back end team at that instant, right? Uh, it's not a formal contract. You can't represent this in a Swagger spec, right? It's a it's just a very weird um, it's this very weird thing that you came up with yourself, right? Uh, and 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 you have to be careful about like you know what characters are allowed, what kind of escaping you're using, what if the uh, key itself contains a dot, right? Then what happens with the syntax? How do you represent arrays? Um, all of that becomes a problem, uh, and and if you look about it, and if if you think about it over the last few slides, we've not done any productive work, right? The data is still being fetched. It's we're just iterating on this on the way we consume the API. That's where all of this iteration is happening, right? We're spending all these cycles working, and the front end team and the back end team is working together. They're not we're not doing anything productive. We're not adding new business logic or there's no new data. We're just iterating on this, right? Which is which is painful. So. So what the folks at Facebook did was they said, let's rethink this from scratch. Instead of having multiple REST endpoints, let's have one endpoint called slash GraphQL. We always make a POST request to that endpoint, whether we're fetching data or setting data or doing anything. Let's make a POST request, and let's query a user. Let's query. Let's the so and and the string that we send, we'll send a query with a user where ID is one. And then ID and name, and whenever we request for just ID and name, that's the only thing you'll we'll get in the response JSON. When we add address and sit and street, you get address and street here. You add city, you get seat. You get address dot city in the response. So the shape of the query, the more fields that you add in the query, the more fields you get in the response, right? And then this is your way of passing arguments. Instead of doing a question mark ID equal to one, you pass it along with a particular uh, field or along with a particular node in the query. Uh, and this language of passing this information, the same information that we were looking at right now, arguments and what fields you want, that information is now being sent as a POST request, and it's being sent in a standardized language. This language is called GraphQL. Mm, if you look at this language, it's basically very similar to JSON, but as if we remove the values and we remove the quotes, right? We remove the quotes, we remove the values, and that skeleton of the JSON that we want, we made that into a we made that into a language, kind of, 
um, and that's what your GraphQL and that's what a GraphQL query looks like. So um, and that's essentially it, right? That's essentially your GraphQL query, um, and the, the server does the same thing. The server parses this GraphQL query and sees that oh, okay, curly braces. What do you want? You want user? What fields you want inside user? Look at the curly braces. You have ID and name. All right, cool. And this is very similar. The server is parsing this this GraphQL query, which is this new string, right? It's a new format. Exactly the way it was parsing this. <coughs> of course, the logic here for parsing this was simpler and more ad hoc, which was just separated around commas. And this is a better parsing logic because it's a little more formal. Um, this is kind of what it looks like, right? Okay, cool. So now, um, the two main insights behind this language that we looked at here, this GraphQL language, is that one, the models in your API are graph-like, right? So you have a user, you have a product, you have addresses. So let's say user, user has addresses and orders, a product has orders and brand, right? A product has these fields, a product has a reference to back brand, a user has ID and name, uh, and it has an address and an order that is related to it, the address experience. Right? So so the, 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 the insight is that most APIs are not actually a collection of independent resources. Like how in a REST API it makes you think that they're all independent resources. Um, in most cases, they're not independent resources, but they're actually resources that have some sort of relationship to each other, uh, more often than not. Right? So you can model it as a bunch of top level nodes, which could be independent. But each of these top level nodes have a link with other nodes, which are kind of dependent on that top level node. Right? And, and that's what, that's, that's one um, insight that GraphQL exploits. The second property of GraphQL is that the client or the API consumer controls what slice of the graph they want. So the GraphQL query allows me to say that in this graph, I only want to fetch this portion of the data. Right, and GraphQL allows you to represent that concept effectively. Right, so instead of saying that I want the whole graph, uh, I just want this slice of the graph, and then you can apply arguments to each portion of the graph to fetch exactly what you need to. Right. Um, all right. So, so that's kind of what a GraphQL query looks like. The stuff that you see in blue, that's a part of the GraphQL syntax itself, and the stuff that you see in gray, that is dependent on your particular API. So the API that I build has user. It takes an argument called ID um, to filter the user, and it takes every user has an ID and a name, and it has an address and the address of the street. So this, what the modeling is and what arguments are allowed uh, for each kind of field, they are defined by the particular API that you have. But the structure here that you see, uh, and these keywords, right, the query keyword, that's a part of the GraphQL spec itself, right? So um, let's take a more detailed look at how GraphQL works underneath. So this is what GraphQL, what an actual GraphQL query looks like. Um, it's a complex diagram, so let's start from the bottom and go clockwise. So a client, which an HTTP client, makes a POST request to a particular URL and sends a JSON content type because you there's no such thing called content type GraphQL, right? So you say content type JSON. Uh, in the body, you send a JSON object which contains a key called query, right? And the query has a value which is the GraphQL string. Right? So this is your GraphQL query. So as a developer, when we are writing API calls, this is the string that we write. Right? And this gets put into a JSON and then gets sent to the server. Right? This is a, this is um, this is how you send your GraphQL query to the server actually. You don't actually send the raw string because then you need to do application content type text. You won't be able to do content type um, um, and, and then there are issues associated with that. Um, but, and, and we'll come to that later. But so content type JSON is the easiest way to send our GraphQL query. Okay. The response is just standard content type JSON. Uh, you get the response. The shape of the response object is that what you request in your GraphQL query. Right? So this is just standard JSON that you're expecting as a response. So that's what a GraphQL query actually looks like. All right. Um, the key thing that, that we could have, that we should take away at this point is that the GraphQL query looks nice, but it's it's an independent string, and that brings its own set of problems, right? It's not it's not useful, right? What we've done with GraphQL, um, what we've done with what what we've done with embedding our API call into a string that's not JSON, that is not very useful. Uh, it's going to cause problems later on, and let's look at the first problem that it will cause, right? The first problem is when we try to parameterize the API call. So when you try to parameterize the API call, typically when you're building an API, 
uh, you're not actually you you're typically making an API endpoint to slash user, but you're also sending an argument called ID equal to one, right? And this is uh, this this part is dynamic, right? This part is not hard coded. This part depends on the user that is using the application. Today, when I open the app, it should have my ID. When you open the app, it will have your ID, right? Um, and and the way you would do this in code is that you will set these parameters programmatically. That means that you will have some code like um, var current user is equal to get current user dot ID, and then you construct this API call by having an HTTP client and then saying you know dot get URL comma and then ID is current user ID, right? And then this HTTP client will construct the string for you and send out this query, right? Um, which is which is which is great. Uh, but if you look at this experience in GraphQL, uh, we know that to pass a parameter, we say query user where ID is one and I want ID and name. So this is the way that we pass an argument. But this whole thing is a string, right? And I need to make this part dynamic. So the way I would have done it in a naive way is that I would have done where current user is get current user ID, and then I would have templated this string where I would have inserted this variable uh, by templating it by using JavaScript templating. But essentially, what this is doing is it's adding strings together, right? It's adding this part of the string plus current user ID plus this part of the string. So we're concatenating these strings uh, to get this. Right, and then we make a post request. We send our JSON where we send the query object and we send the query string. Right, um, we send the query key and the query key we put our query string, which is this query string. Right, um, this is this is terrible because um, because this is string templating. Right, and the string templating is bad because um, it's error prone uh, and it's confusing. Uh, I mean, there are multiple reasons, but but some of the reasons are, for example, that it's error prone. Like what 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 if we were getting this from a form input? And in the form input, somebody entered a special character like a close close bracket or a close braces, right? Or put a comma or put a colon. Put any of these keywords or these characters that are part of the GraphQL syntax itself, right? If that came in, you'd have to escape that before you insert it here, right? Um, or maybe somebody can do an equivalent of an SQL injection attack when they can change the query that is being sent from the client to the server, right? Uh, I mean, which is not a security problem because typically your API security will not depend on somebody being able to make a bad API call. Uh, it will be it will be protected from those attacks. But um, it's still inconvenient and it creates a error surface area that you don't want. Right? It's it's painful um, and and this is a problem. So thankfully we don't have to do this and yeah, I didn't invent GraphQL. Um, but um, when when they built GraphQL, they realized that this is going to be an issue. So so the idea is to use something called query variables. And what you do here is when you create a GraphQL query, instead of putting in the value or even referencing the value in a, in a template string, you just say user ID is dollar user ID. So this is not a JavaScript string templating variable. It's a part of the GraphQL query string where you just call it dollar user ID. And then you send this query to the server. When the server sees this query and tries to pass this query, the server says, okay, cool, you're saying you're asking for a user, that's fine. The user has an ID and a name, that's also fine. And the parameter that you want for the user is ID, and the ID should be equal to user ID. But this variable is this does not have a value. I mean, as soon as the server sees that there's a dollar here, the server knows that this is a reference. And this value doesn't exist yet. So then the server expects a variables object to be sent and expects that the variables object which is going to be a standard JSON object, uh, which is going to be represented as a standard JSON. Um, this should have a user ID variable inside it that the server can use to extract and then use that value on the server side. So what you do is you send the variables object that contains the same name, user ID, and then you send that along with the query. So your query string now is independent and whatever you want to make dynamic, you send it inside a variables object. So that's the way you send your query and your variables, right? Um, and this is nice because this allows us to separate out and modularize our code. So we can create our GraphQL queries that say I want this user and the last 10 orders or the last 100 orders, right? And you can parameterize these two parts. But you don't need to do it inside your GraphQL query. So your GraphQL query can live inside a separate file, like queries.js or whatever. Um, and then you can have your variables which lives inside, which is kind of closer to your UI component, right? So your UI component is extracting those variables, so it's closer to that. Uh, and and then you have the HTTP client 
and, and then you typically don't write this code. A GraphQL client allows you to not write this code, and you just write this, and it works. Um, which is basically a GraphQL client is basically a wrapper over this. Uh, but but this client code can also be separated out now, right? So so now you can modularize it because you don't need this variable to be in the same scope as this string because you're not doing string templating. Um, and now you can kind of start modularizing and looking at each piece of your GraphQL query and your variable separate. If you look at some of the other more advanced concepts in GraphQL query, like uh, fragments or some things with directives, you'll realize that a lot of those concepts are there in GraphQL to deal with the fact that a GraphQL query cannot be manipulated in a very dynamic way, right? Because it's it's it's, it's a new language that does not have a native representation in in uh, in other languages, right? Like for example, if you think about JSON, um, most dynamic languages can very easily let you flip back and forth between an object or a dictionary structure or a key value structure into a JSON. It's it's almost a it's almost a one to one mapping most of the times, right? Um, you can take any JavaScript object and you can just do dot stringify, a JSON dot stringify, and you you'd have it converted into JSON. I mean, not true because if you're using functions inside it or you're using uh, you're referencing other complicated structures inside it, it won't serialize. But um, uh, but from the point of view of just creating data objects, a JavaScript object maps very well to JSON, right? Imagine this is a JavaScript object. To make it dynamic, I would have just done dot id is equal to something and dot limit equal to something. And then I would have done JSON dot stringify, which would have taken care of serializing it and encoding it properly, right? Um, but because GraphQL query is a new, it's a new language, it's a new string, you have to deal with trying to make this string reusable and modular. And one of those concepts is a GraphQL data. So other concepts that you will see are um, also let you deal with the fact that the GraphQL queries are their own language, right? All right, cool. Let's quickly jump into um, write APIs. We looked at GraphQL read APIs. Let's look at write APIs. Um, if you look at a write API, we um, typically, in the good old days, you had a post request. You could have a post, a put, a delete, or a patch. Um, I've not seen too many people using put, delete, or patch uh, at work. Everybody tries to get a post as much as possible. Um, and then you have a post endpoint. You send a JSON that contains your parameter for this is the object I want to insert, like the to-do that I want to create. And the response, you get a JSON, right? You get, a, okay, here's your to-do, and here's the ID that you created automatically. Here's the ID as a response. Uh, and this is what the REST file looks like. In GraphQL, we only have one endpoint, which is slash GraphQL. And instead of doing a query, we call it a mutation. And so we say mutation, add to do. And then we pass in the argument, to do is a JSON object. And we want the ID as a response. So the same structure as the query. You're still having a field that specifies what responses you want. And you have arguments that specify what data you're sending, right? And thank God for GraphQL query variables, because we can refer to this as a variable. Imagine if we could not, right? We would have to actually like insert the JSON inside this by string concatenation, like the, it's a nightmare. Um, but now you can use GraphQL query variables and this becomes very easy. Um, and so a mutation is add to do, your mutation could be called update to do or delete to do, right? You don't have different rest verbs. Everything is a post request, so that doesn't matter. But now the idea of what the API call is doing is embedded inside the name of the mutation. So it's called add to do or delete to do or post to do, or, I mean, sorry, or update to do, and then you send the right arguments um, and you get the same response and you request the response, right? Um, all right. The other uh, cool thing about GraphQL is that it has a nice spec for real-time or eventing capabilities. This means that you can, for example, if you're building an e-commerce kind of app or an order delivery kind of app, right? On the back end, let's say your order object is going to change it. Um, the payment is processed, the delivery person is ready and is, is, is uh, sending this out for delivery. Now this is happening asynchronously, right? This is not happening within like one millisecond or 100 milliseconds or a second. This is happening whenever it happens, right? Um, and whenever this change happens on the back end, you want this change to be reflected on the front end. You want you want a nice UI that says, here, your order is out for delivery or your order has been delivered or the payment has been processed, right? Building this experience is painful with REST because your first option is to do something like polling. Which is, which is a terrible experience because you have to make repeated requests every x seconds to refetch data. Now, this just, this just feels bad. It feels like I don't want to do this work as an engineer. Um, in fact, it technically works quite well, but sometimes it's just painful to do this work, right? Um, and so you, have to, you have to create a polling thread, you have to create a polling kind of like a, um, you have to start a polling, uh, 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 
like a set interval kind of thing from your client. And then you have to remember to clean it up also. Because if I go to other pages in the app, you shouldn't be polling for the old thing that you have. So this is a painful experience. Um, and also on mobile, it's bad because you're creating more and more HTTP connection that is good. The other option is to use WebSockets. But that moves from being, from being a bad experience to just being a nightmare. Because WebSockets are a very painful experience for the client, right? To open up WebSocket connections, to deal with WebSockets, to deal with missing events, to do authentication over WebSockets. All of these things are painful. WebSockets are technically a part of the HTTP spec, so it's not a problem. But it's just that dealing with WebSockets on the client and on the server is painful. Um, and so dealing with raw WebSockets is not fun. With GraphQL, the experience is that you create something called a subscription. You say that I want order, where the order is uh, you know, ID 57, and I want these two fields. And then in the response that you get, you keep getting an event that has the same shape as the shape that you requested. And so every time this changes, you might get an event that says, hey, here's what ha what's happened. And, and this depends on your API and what real time um, APIs you have, right? Um, cool. So, um, so, so, so underneath it, a GraphQL subscription still uses WebSockets. But as a front-end developer, I don't have to deal with WebSockets. This is my abstraction. I deal with the subscription query. Stuff happens for me. I don't care how it happens. The actual logic for dealing with uh, subscriptions, uh, for dealing with WebSockets, is taken care of by the community that who has written, who have written good GraphQL clients. Right? I don't have to deal with this work. Um, and thankfully, this is just taken care of me. Uh, and I will hopefully show you a demo if we have some time. Although we're coming to run out of time now. All right, cool. So let me quickly get to the last portion of why um, GraphQL is amazing. Your experience of sharing and documenting APIs that you have today probably looks something like this, right? You have an API developer. They uh, they build an API, right? And after they build an API, uh, after they build an API, they document the API, right? The reason why this is a red box is because this often doesn't happen, right? Like they don't document the API. But maybe they're nice people and they document the API. And depending on the level of how much they care about you, they, the API developer um, you know, has a Google Sheet. Um, they document some sample API calls in a Google Sheet and share that with you. Or they maybe make a Postman collection. Or maybe it's like super hardcore and they have a Swagger spec. Uh, and every time they write code, the Swagger spec is updated. And you, you, have, you have a UI and you're looking at an API documentation. Like, kudos to you if, this is, if, if you have this setup. Um, but this is rare, right? Um, after this, you read the documentation. You notice the red box again, uh, because most often, like you try the API out, you don't actually read the documentation very specifically. Um, and then you start integrating the API. And then once you integrate the API, you realize that you know the docs were they were out of date, they were wrong, they were missing. Like the API spec said that they did it on a boolean called true false, but on the on the actual when you're looking at the API, you're getting a string with a capital T R U E because it's a Python backend which is serializing it, uh, and they're serializing the boolean in a weird way. They're not converting it to JSON in the right way. It, it's just weird, right? You're getting these weird kind of uh, errors that you don't want to deal with. Uh, with GraphQL, the experience, and, and, and the, the problem, the reason why this is a problem is because, not because people are evil, is because the process of building an API and the process of documenting an API are independent. The process of building the API does not involve writing documentation. Documentation is a completely orthogonal, uh, asynchronous step that I do after I build the API, or maybe completely independent of the API lifecycle itself, right? Mm. With GraphQL, is not the case. You build a GraphQL API, the users start integrating the GraphQL API. The whole documentation process and the integration experience and the exploration of the API experience is taken care of by community tooling. Uh, and I'll show you how, again, towards the demo. Uh, the reason why this works is because when you hear about GraphQL, people will often say that the GraphQL, GraphQL is a type system. Um, and this is because when you're building a GraphQL API, you're building a GraphQL schema. You have a user type, you have a product type, the user type has a reference to an address, and that means that when you're writing a GraphQL API, you have to explicitly or implicitly build this GraphQL schema. And that means that your server has these types that are implicitly or explicitly defined. Right? So you say that there's a type called user, which has an ID, integer, name, string, and an address, which is a reference to an address type. The address type is an ID, int, a street, which is a string, city, which is a string. So these are explicitly defined. right? And because these are explicitly defined, um, like this is this is the type system that your API has. This is, this is one property. The second property is that every GraphQL server is an introspection API. This means that if I'm a GraphQL server uh, and I have a to-do API, 
you can make a query to me and say, hey, query the to dos, give me names and IDs and you know user ID and stuff like that, and I will respond to that data to you, right? But you can also make a query to me and say, what are the models that you have? You can introspect the API. Any GraphQL server is introspectable, so you can ask me what models uh, you know I have, and I will respond to you with saying, oh, I have to dos. And then you can ask me, what is a to-do? You can actually make a GraphQL query to say, for this type that you have called to-do, can you tell me what fields you have and what the names of those fields are? And this will be the response from the GraphQL server, which will tell you what fields I have and what the types of those fields are. And this is insane because the community has gone crazy over the last few years and they've built all kinds of crazy tools. Like in your IDE, when you're typing out a GraphQL query, uh, the IDE will make a request to the GraphQL server and keep validating if the GraphQL query is correct. So if you misspell a particular field in your API, you'll get a red underline. Because the IDE knows that the GraphQL server is saying that this field does not exist. Right? And that's a whole that's an amazing amount of that's an amazing improvement in the experience for a front end that. Right? Uh, and I will again quickly get to an example of showing you that. So that let me zoom through this. Um, I'm going to use Hasura for doing a quick example. Um, I'm going to deploy this on Heroku. All right, so let's call this the uh... all right. Um, so I'm deploying uh, Hasura, which is a GraphQL uh, backend, like a API backend, uh, and I'm deploying it on a Postgres database. Um, technically, you can. I mean, when you're building your own GraphQL server, you don't even need to have a database. You might have a database. It can be any database whatsoever, right? It's just that for the Hasura demo, we'll be using Postgres. Um, and what is happening right now is that Heroku is creating the database. It's created a container and it's running for us. So that's our GraphQL endpoint. That's the endpoint that our apps will be hitting. Uh, let's go in and create some tables. So let's say we have a users table with ID as integer and name as text. And now uh, I can go in and insert some data here. Got my right. Uh, and now what I can do is I can make a graph here. Right. Notice the autocomplete. Right. I can get users. All right. ID uh, and name it. My misspelling there. Right. Um, and so and so this is kind of what you. This is the response that you get. Right. So according to the shape that I want in the graph here, right, I get this response. But let's say I misspell something. Let's say I say UID, right? I get a red underline. And, and this is because GraphQL, which is also a tool, an open source tool built by Facebook, uh, that we kind of embedded in our UI here. If you over on this, it says cannot query field UID or type user's ID, right? Um, because because this, this tool, Graphical, has made an introspection query to fetch all, to fetch what the user type is and what the different types are. And it's giving you that kind of experience here. Right, um, and that's why I can look at these docs and say, okay, I can query. I can query for a user, and this is the user type. Right, and this documentation is also auto-generated for any GraphQL backend. Right, this is not uh, this is not just a GraphQL backend that Hasura is giving you. Right, um, let's take a look at a quick other thing also. So let me um, show you a few examples with a few relationships. So I'm going to connect to the database directly and import an existing database um, so that I don't have to initialize a bunch of models. Um, that's the user table that I just created uh, on the UI. I have an existing database dump, so I'm going to import that in my database. All right, I'm importing that data. Um, and you'll see that these tables come up, and we say that they're not tracked on GraphQL, so I'm exposing that. And here are the foreign keys, and I would like to expose all the foreign keys as relationships, right? So now what I can do is I can say query, autocomplete, albums, um, every album has an ID and a title. This is a music database, so I can fetch this data, right? Um, I can also fetch artists, uh, and th this is coming in from a separate table. So every album has an artist, right? And this is actually coming in from a separate table. So artist is a separate table. Album is a separate table, right? But they have a relationship because of this artist ID um, that I can fetch. I can also do things like saying that I would like to fetch the total number of music tracks that I have, right? Uh, because the data import is running as we speak, 
right? Um, I can convert this to a subscription. And now you'll see that this data is changing here again, right? Because um, as the data is changing here, Hustler is giving us a subscription query that I can run to kind of get this data as it happens, right? So um, and as a front-end developer, I don't care about anything. I just I have to write a subscription, and then these events just come to me automatically, and I just get that update happening automatically, right? Uh, which is super convenient. So, um, so, so that's kind of what, that's a quick GraphQL demo and showing you a few things. Um, I'll show you an example of a mutation also, just to kind of, um, let me insert a new object called, again, if you look at my autocomplete, I see that the field is called name. It's name it here, but it should be name. Um, and I can create something else and do returning ID, right? Um, and so that's kind of what a mutation looks like. Um, and then if I go back and query the users, you see the users here, right? Uh, but I'm, I'm rushing through this because we're kind of out of time. Uh, but this is kind of what, uh, I hope this gives you a sense of what GraphQL queries look like, uh, how GraphQL backends and frontends work a little bit, um, and, um, and, um, and, and, and how Azure works on top of a Postgres database to give this to you. But um, if you have any questions or if you have time for questions, I can take those questions now. Um, but otherwise, that's it for my side. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, I don't know if anyone has. I have one. Can you use GraphQL sure. TypeScript? Can you use GraphQL with TypeScript? Yes. Yes, you can use GraphQL with any language. Both on the front end or the back end. Uh, there are there are um, lots of different frameworks for you to be able to write GraphQL servers and uh, consume a GraphQL API with any language. GraphQL and TypeScript is also a very good fit. So uh, because GraphQL has a type, uh, every API has a type, right? So it maps to a type a TypeScript object for you uh, pretty easy. Okay. We have two questions. Bring another mic. Hi, so um, can I write some middlewares with Hashura? Because uh, I'm thinking about, for example, uploading an image from the client, and I would like to uh, have it some treatment on the server side. And maybe I don't want to store it in Postgres. Maybe I want to do something else with it. And, oh, uh, yeah. So how does it so, yeah, yeah. There are two approaches. One is that you can write your own remote schema. So you can write your own GraphQL server that handles the file upload. Um, and then you can, and then Hasura will kind of stitch that together for you. So I have an example of a Pokemon schema. Let me just quickly show you a Pokemon schema. So I think I have that somewhere here. Uh, So uh, I'm, I have this GraphQL Pokemon schema that somebody else has built actually, and it's deployed on now, uh, and that has its own GraphQL endpoint. So I stitch that together with Hasura, and now what I can do is I can do query, and I see uh, Pokemons. And these Pokemons are not in my database, right? So these Pokemons are clearly not in my database. <laughs> I can do ID, name, uh, attacks, and you know, whatever attacks they have, what fast attack. The name of the attack go. So Bulbasaur has a tackle and a wine tip, whatever. Uh, but this, this, I'm fetching this, I'm running this GraphQL query on mutation uh, from a GraphQL server that is not mine. So what you would do is you would write your own file upload type schema, and we make it easy for you. We have different serverless functions and boilerplates that you can try out. Glitches are very easy to try it out. Um, you know, we can just write some code in the browser and then try it out. So, but basically, you build your own GraphQL resolver and then you stitch it together with Hasura. That's one approach. For a file upload specifically, even a, a, a better way is that you um, you upload direct you upload directly to S3 because that's a high performance upload. Like you get streaming upload and download. You upload to S3. Um, S3 triggers an event, uh, and then that event has triggers a lambda, and then that lambda can go in and update the database and say that image ID or profile image ID has been updated. Um, and then you can run a subscription on a user. Uh, and you know the, the image ID will come up. So so you can you can do it completely asynchronously rather than doing it synchronously. That's also another approach. Uh, that also works for you. Yeah, thank you. 
Uh, hello. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is it possible? I mean, how are mutations are made? I mean, uh, uh, do you uh, define them or they are predefined? Oh, okay. No. So if you're writing your own. Also, in terms of. Security. If you're writing your own. Okay. Sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Say that again? No, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm dropping. You can go ahead. <laughs> I mean, in turn, um, I, I saw that there, there, there were a create or new, uh, I mean, mutation. But uh, did you define them or they are predefined by uh, on, on the server side? And how is security uh, built? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, so, Hasura, by default, we, we, we create queries, aggregation, subscription, mutations, and mutations for doing insert, update, and delete. So you see that I can do insert, uh, I can do insert, I can do an update, uh, I can do delete, right? So we have mutations predefined for all of these. Um, and the way security works is that, for example, on every table, you can define a set of permissions. And so you can say that, right now it's really everything is an admin. But you can say that I have a user, and a user can um, you know, only select data that belongs to them. And this ID, Will come from a cookie, so this XSR user ID will come from a sorry, will come from a cookie or a JWT token or something else, and you can choose what columns they have access to. The same thing for an insert, right? For an insert, you can say I can only insert if the ID is equal to my ID. So I can't insert data that belongs to another user, uh, and I can force that a particular column can only have a particular value, right? So, so that way, whenever I run a mutation, I can only insert the name value. The ID value will be preset to what I'm seeing in the session variable, right? Um, and, and so this allows you to do a bunch of things directly. Uh, it doesn't cover 100% of the use cases, but it does cover like, it depends on the application that you're building. Right? It might cover 90%, it might cover 100%. Um, but for those use cases that it covers, it's useful. For those use cases that you feel like the mutation is going to be very complicated, right? The mutation is going to, uh, you know, every time a mutation comes in, we need to run some algorithm, transform some data, and only then insert it in the database. Um, and if you're doing something like that, then the best way to do it is again to just write your own resolver, right? You can just write your own mutation resolver and then stitch that with Hasura, and then not expose a Hasura insert mutation by uh, going to the permissions thing and switching that off. Um, and that works. That that also works well. But most kinds of mutations. Like even nested mutation, right? I want to insert an artist and simultaneously I want to insert all the artists in the albums. So you can insert a nested JSON and the entire nested JSON will be converted into, will be normalized and inserted into the right tables by Hustle automatically. Um, and so Hustle does a bunch of automated stuff for you, but uh, there are always certain cases that you can't represent and those are best to do with just remote schemas. I would like to ask that if we don't want to use the Hashura and we want to use uh, uh, another backend, and is there any uh, client for different uh, languages, or client support for different languages? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so for that, uh, for that client, these clients translate those queries into like a filter or a select statement. Right. So it's um, it's possible. Um, you can. I mean, obviously, Hasura is just one example implementation of a GraphQL backend. You can obviously build your own GraphQL backend in whatever language you want. Uh, like I have an example of a Hello World kind of backend. Right. So this is a Hello World. This is a, a Node.js uh, GraphQL server, and it defines one type called Hello and uh, it returns world, right? But what you would do here is instead of doing hello, um, in your case, for example, when you're making a database call. So you are saying um, that we have to make the, uh, the database call, right? And we have to make yeah, sure. exactly. So what you do here is just, uh, right now I'm just returning, I'm doing a return on word. I'm just returning one string. But what you would do is you would say, you know, db dot get like hello, something. Right? Uh, you would do something like that, and then you will return that response. 
right? Something you you would do something like that, um, and and that also works fine. Um, the problem though with a GraphQL backend that is talking to the database that you would write is the way of writing a GraphQL backend causes your resolvers to be called uh, multiple times. So for example, let's say I'm making a GraphQL query to fetch the uh, albums, right? So let's say this is the query that we're running, right? Um, let's make it a little more complicated. Let's say we want all of those albums where the artists have a name that starts with A, right? So Hasura exposes this argument to you and we have this predefined. But let's say you are building this yourself, right? So now what you have to do is um, your the resolvers that will be called will be you will the album function and the artist function will be called for you. So you will have a uh, albums function and you will have an artist function and both of them will be called. But the problem is that it will be called n plus one times. Uh, what will end up happening is that let's say you have uh, 300 albums, right? Um, you will first make a query to fetch the 300 albums. Then for each of the albums, you will make a query to fetch the artist for those 300 albums from the database. So you make 300 plus one queries. One query for the album and 300 for artists. Um, and, and this is the n plus one query problem, right? And this will happen if you are, um, and this is this is the big issue, right? So, so you have to do some kind of optimizations to make sure that instead of making so many calls to the database, you make only two calls to the database. Um, and, and at minimum, if you use something like data loader, there are a bunch of techniques to do this, but you can you can make a minimum of two queries. You make one query for albums, and then you make one query for artists, where you fetch the artists for all the 300 albums in one shot. Um, so that's what you would do if you were writing your own backend. And there are a bunch of different ways of different tools for doing this. You can use your own ORM. You can use you know whatever you want to do. You can write direct SQL queries. Uh, uh, you can you can use Hasura from your backend. You can do anything, right? The but the um, but the, the Hasura approach is very different. What we do is we compile that into a single SQL query. So that's the SQL query that Hasura generates, right? Uh, and that's one single SQL query that can, that processes all of your data in one shot, uh, including the authorization and the access control stuff. Um, and that makes it very, very fast. Um, right? That's why kind of if you look at the response that I'm getting from this query, I'm sitting in New York, the server is in San Francisco. Um, it's like a few 10, 10, 20 milliseconds, right? So, um, and, and that works well. This is harder to do yourself, but it's totally possible. Like, and that's what most people do.